You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Hey, Foundry, welcome uh, back after a week, probably cooped up in the house after Snowpocalypse 2019. As we get back into normal life, uh, it's great to be back with you and worshiping with you. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 9. We're really going to deal with the point. What's the point of what's going on? And in Luke 9, Jesus really is directing us back to what is most important and what is critical. Um, When I was young, I know this, my brother and I, we lived out uh, in the high desert of western Colorado when I was young, and there were rocks everywhere. So we did what we always did. We had rock fights, which sounds as stupid as it was. I mean... There's a lot of hospital trips and a number of things that happened badly. But I remember one time we were throwing rocks back and forth, and um, a rock went through uh, a neighbor's window's truck, a uh, truck's window, and um, that wasn't awesome. And we were in a ton of trouble. And I remember my parents were severely reprimanding Lincoln, my older brother, and I. We are tired of the rock fights. No more rock fights. You know. And my dad was like, I am tired of buying windows. We we bought a lot of windows. Literally, the glass company knew my dad dad by name. He'd be like, oh, hey, Neil, what the boys break? And like, it was pretty common for us. I remember they were just giving us what for. They were like, stop having rock fights. We don't want to buy more windows. And um, and then they kind of had this moment afterwards where my mom's like, do you know what's wrong here? And we're like, you don't want to buy windows? And they're like, oh. We don't want you throwing rocks. Quit missing the point. The windows being broken is because you're throwing rocks. Stop doing that. And we're like, okay. You know, like kids would. We're like, why are you getting so mad and purple? Like, that was really what we, we missed the point. We thought they were mad about the windows. They were asking us to quit throwing rocks. And today we're going to look at Luke chapter 9 and realize that Jesus has similar experiences with the disciples just missing the point of what he's saying time and again. So join me as we read through Luke chapter 9, 18 to 36. Once, when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowds say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he asked, who do you say that I am? Peter answered, you are God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. Don't tell anyone about what Peter just said. And he said to them, the Son of Man, speaking of himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed on the, killed, and on the third day raised to life. And then he said to all of them, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever wants to lose it, whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose their very soul? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes into his glory and in the glory of the Father and his holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God come. Then, about eight days after this, Jesus said this. About eight days after Jesus said this, he took Peter, John, and James, and he went up on a mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face changed. His clothes became as bright as a flash of lightning. Two men, Moses and Elijah, appeared in glorious splendor, talking with Jesus, and they spoke about his departure which was about to bring to fulfillment at Jerusalem. Peter and his companions were very sleepy, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men standing with them. And the men were leaving, and just as the men were leaving, Peter said to him, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us uh, put up three different shelters, three different little houses, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He didn't really know what he was talking about or saying. And while he was speaking, a cloud appeared and covered them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. A voice spoke from the cloud, saying, This is my son, whom I have chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, they found that Jesus was alone. The disciples kept this to themselves and didn't tell anyone 
what they had seen. When you look at this text, there is so much going on in it that's actually worth kind of grabbing onto and and wrestling with. What is Jesus saying and what's going on? But I think one of the underlying realities is the loneliness of Jesus' calling. The loneliness of it. Because, well, in, in my mind, kind of the analogy is like, it's like being on a life raft in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, surrounded by quadrillions of gallons of water and dying of thirst because you can't drink it. That's how it would have been for Jesus being surrounded by thousands of people constantly, but no one really knows or identifies with him. They don't understand what he's doing, not even his disciples. We'll look very closely at them and understand that, that Jesus' disciples, they didn't get it. They didn't understand what Jesus was about and what he was doing. And at times it felt like accidentally, but they opposed him. They kind of rode in the wrong direction. And I think for Jesus, he has a lonely calling. It's this place of loneliness and isolation. Jesus is among the crowds, but he's alone within it because nobody fully identifies with him. In John chapter 2, verse 24, it says this, Jesus wouldn't entrust himself to anyone, to no man or woman, because he knew what was in people's hearts. Jesus knew how fickle humanity was, and he knew they would betray him and walk away from him, so he didn't entrust himself or fully give himself to them. And I think for you and I, that should be something we remember, that people will always fail, but Jesus Christ knows God the Father won't. God the Father won't, and we'll see this play out through Luke chapter 9. Continuing in Luke chapter 9, we, we know this, that within this lonely calling, Jesus begins to Um, speak of the greater isolation, how he will be removed. And it says this. While everyone was marveling at all that Jesus did, this is in uh, Luke chapter 9, 43, he said this to his disciples. Listen carefully to what I'm about to tell you. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. But they didn't, the disciples didn't understand what this meant. It was hidden from them, so they didn't grasp it. And they were afraid to ask him about it. They were afraid to ask him. So I'm picturing this very um, awkward tension where Jesus says this and they're like, "Mm, okay, and they just kind of look away. They don't know how to handle it. I don't know if you've ever had that in your own life where you can tell somebody doesn't understand what you said, but they just kind of pretend and move on. And I think for Jesus, we recognize that, that he is very gracious to them, and he knows they don't understand it. This isn't the first time Jesus has said this to them. If you look back in Mark, in the gospel, the first time he says it, in Mark chapter 9, we can see what happens. It says this in Mark 8, actually, verse 31. It says, he began to teach that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter, his disciple, took him aside and began to rebuke him. I mean, that takes guts, right? Like Jesus is teaching about these things. This is the first time he's ever said it. And, And Peter grabs him. He's like, hey, I need to have a talk with you real quick. Hey, that's not good. It's a really bad, t- I mean, imagine what it would be like. That's, you shouldn't be saying these things. But Jesus has this moment where he turns and he looks at his disciples and he rebukes Peter and he says, get behind me, Satan, which had to sting, right? That would be the lamest. But he said, you don't, Peter, you don't have in mind the concerns of God. You only have the concerns of humans in you. You don't see what God sees, Peter. You don't know what God values. You value what you see right in front of you. You've got human concerns. Jesus had this immeasurably large task in front of him. He had this isolated point where he had to obey again and again out there alone. Even though people were around him and sometimes opposing him. No one could understand it. And as we see in in Mark chapter 8... They didn't accept it. And in Luke chapter 9, they still didn't understand it, and they were too afraid to ask anything about it. Can you imagine knowing that you were going to be betrayed? 
Like, can you imagine if you had like some sort of clairvoyance and you could go to school, right, and know that your best friend was going to say something bad about you? And you'd walk up and you're like, look here, Marky, and just go off on her because you're like, you're going to betray me later today, right? You would, you would lay into him. You and I would lay into him because we'd be like, you're not going to get to me first. You know, kind of the preemptive strike mentality, but not Jesus. Not Jesus. He knew he, would be, be, he would be betrayed. He knew he would be rejected. He knew he would be flogged almost to death, crucified. And he had no one he could confide in and pour his heart out to. No one around him to support him in this. Can you imagine the sense of loneliness? Can you imagine the sense of loneliness? I mean, when they, when they talk about the psychological effects of isolation, it actually physiologically changes us. When we are put, like when you put a human into um, solitary confinement and remove human contact, people come unglued because we're made for relationship and we see Jesus is being further and further removed from true connection, not the superficial stuff, but true connection, being understood, being heard, Right? How many um, conflicts have we got into because we heard what someone said, but we heard it in our way and not what they were trying to say? Anybody else? Right? I've had it so many times in my own life where that happens. I say something, and it's heard as something else. For Jesus, we see that he is becoming more and more isolated in his own life. People don't get what he's about. And people, his own disciples are kind of fighting him on this. It would have been a very lonely road. And that's why I believe Jesus retreated and spent time in the place that mattered, in the relationship that mattered most. He would spend times, it says it over and over in the Gospels, that Jesus would leave the crowds and go to a solitary place, a quiet, lonely mountaintop, a place where he could be alone with his heavenly Father. Even his closest friends were caught up in the here and now, but Jesus knew that his heavenly Father had a bigger picture in mind and that God's purposes and God's glory was more important than his present comfort. So Jesus would retreat to the one who understood why all things were happening. And Jesus would spend time with his Father. In Luke 9, it tells us that after Jesus predicted his death again, soon after, he caught his disciples having a fight about who among them is going to be the greatest, right? It's like this, being on a road trip to Florida and the car catches on fire and your parents are going, we can't afford to fix the car, we're stuck in Georgia, and you're going, well, when we get a new car, I get front seat, right? Isn't that what it sounds like when I hear that? I'm like, that's what I see in this. Like, well, who cares? The front seat is a charcoal briquette. Yeah, well, it's mine, mm-hmm. right? That's how we get, and that's what the disciples, literally, they're like little kids. They're like little kids. They're like, well, I don't know if you think you're the greatest, Mr. Smells Like Fish, you know, because he was a fisherman or whatever. Like, they would have been frustrating to be around. Jesus has just said, by the way, I'm going to be rejected, betrayed, crucified, and killed. I'm the greatest. Oh, it would be so exhausting. So let's just take a minute and spend some time in the adventure land of missing the point. Because the disciples take us there so many times throughout the Gospels. There are the parallel texts in Luke 9 and Mark 8 where we see that happening. But there's a lot of the stories in in the Gospels where the disciples just flat out miss the point. I mean, they swing before the pitch is thrown. They're just really off base. First of all, there's this one um, story in Mark chapter 8 where Jesus says, Beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod. And what he's talking about is this little bit yeast. If you put a little yeast into the dough, it can, you know, leaven or, or puff up the whole loaf. If you put a little bit of sin, a little bit of pride, you mix it into someone and it can swell up the whole thing. It can mess up the whole batch. That's what Jesus is talking about. Do you know what the disciples heard? When, he's, when he said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Herod, do you know what they said? Do you think he's ticked off at us because we forgot to buy bread? They literally said that. And he just had to be like, oh, man. Like the frustration, but he never seems to show it. He teaches them and walks with them, but they miss the, literally, they said, oh, my gosh, did, you know, John, did you buy bread? Oh, John, boo, right? They, they kind of like miss, so miss the point on that story. There was a point we just read about the Mount of Transfiguration 
where Jesus is being spoken to, and we'll talk about this at the end. It's really, it reveals something wonderful of the heart of God. But Jesus is being spoken to by Moses and Elijah. They're glowing, their clothes are like lightning on, um, on the Mount of Transfiguration. And what does Peter do? It is good for us to be here. Do you want me to build you guys a house real quick so you can stay here? And literally, God comes down in the form of a cloud. And if you look at the text, it says this. When the cloud came down, they were scared as they went into it. Like, all of a sudden you say the wrong thing and a cloud appears and begins to swallow you. You're like, oh. I'm in so much trouble, right? Because Peter missed the point. He wanted to find a place to kind of put a box around God and have this wonderful thing right there all the time. But that wasn't God's intention. God's intention was like, this is my son. Listen to him. I love him. And Peter just missed the point profoundly. In Luke 9, the disciples, we find this story where the disciples um, are wanting to stop a man from driving demons out of another person in Jesus' name. Like, hey, he's driving demons out in your name, Jesus. Make him stop. It's like your friend hitting a home run with your bat and going, no, it doesn't count. It was my bat. Right? You'd be like, what is wrong with you? You know, why would you do that? But, but they're, they're like a little possessive. That's their thing. You can see how their focus is so narrow to humanity. They, they only see their opportunity or their way. They don't see what God's doing in it. They completely miss the point. Probably one of my favorites is in Luke chapter 9. The disciples come to Jesus after um, a town, kind of uh, a Samaritan town, asks him uh, to leave. They, they don't want him there. And they didn't receive Jesus. And the disciples say, would you like us to call down fire on this place? You know, not like, so you're good with that, clearly, but I'm not. Like, this is clearly, like, I don't know if you've ever watched the show Survivor, but somebody who's had a hard time in the show all of a sudden gets a little power, and they're like Don Corleone all of a sudden, like, yeah, you can see me, you know, and they're all weird, and you're like, whoa, what's going on? Like, all of a sudden, this powerless person has power, and they're like, whoa. That's what we see in the disciples, they were fishermen, tax collectors, and people on the fringes of society. And suddenly they're walking with Jesus and they don't get received well. And they're like, would you like us to nuke them? That's what they're asking. Call down fire from heaven and obliterate the whole town and village. Because, well, we were treated poorly. They would have been awesome on social media, right? They would have burned it down on Twitter or whatever else. They'd have been like, how dare you? Um, I just look at this and I think that is exactly the way that we can be. We can miss the point. And the disciples showed us that when we have our eyes on human things, we miss the point time and time again. So right now, let's, let's just, um, let's take a minute and look back. Because in, in your devotions this past week, you would have, if you did them, you would have had the opportunity and studied the answer to why Jesus would heal someone or perform a miracle or tell the disciples something and then say, don't tell anyone. Don't tell anyone. Why would Jesus do that? Because, well, they weren't ready to share the gospel. They were still missing the point. It hadn't transformed their perspective on life. Their minds were still on the temporary. The things of this life, this world, these comforts. They would have muddled the message because they were missing the point, even though they were right next to Jesus and deeply invested in his ministry. They were still missing the point. There was a lack of transformation to God's perspective. It's like when you tell somebody about the peace that Christ has brought you in your own life, right? And then you run around life having nothing but anxiety and worry. And people are like, question about the peace you're so clearly not displaying, right? When, when we tell people how much peace the Prince of Peace has done in our life and then we're owned by our anxieties, it, it doesn't, it muddles the message. And what we have to do is, is let God transform our perspective and get his view on it. His Holy Spirit lives inside us. He, he fills us. We can get God's perspective on these things. So here's what we have to do. We have to look back and know that these same disciples who were so profoundly gifted at missing the point also once they are completely different once they understand once they understand what Jesus was doing and what he was here for. They get it. 
what, when they get what Jesus did by dying on the cross, rising again, and once they were filled with the Spirit, suddenly they were ready to share the news. These disciples who missed the point so often finally had the point. They understood that Jesus' life was not about presently the here and now, being comfortable. It was being transformed and preparing them for eternity. With Christ, it was redeeming them out of their sin and into Christ's life. So you don't have to miss the point. You don't have to miss the point, and I think that's so important. You, if you are given, if you have given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're a Christian, give him full lordship over your life. Allow him to fill you with his Holy Spirit and ask God to give you his perspective on the things happening around you, because how nice would that be, right? When God gives us perspective on things happening around us. I'm gonna tell you a real quick story. This past week, we, we opened the church up, and I didn't want to, to be perfectly honest. Someone came to, to Erica and said, you know, let's do a warming center. And I was like, oh, kind of want a snow day. Appreciate that. But, you know, kind of pushed it off just a touch. And then the night before the vortex descended on us and mauled our lives with freezing cold wind, um, someone hit me up and uh, texted me and said, hey, I really, it was a different person. I really feel like we need to respond. We need to plow driveways, bring people food. We need to be the church. And it was like God was just like, can you get my perspective on this? And I was like, oh. I wasn't immediately joyful. I, I didn't see it, but we responded. And what was amazing was to watch the church respond, to watch people in the church respond and just come alive to go drive around in this crazy madness out there and deliver groceries to over 20 families, to go plow driveways of people we don't know, to take care of the, the hurting, the needy, and the lonely, to go do these things in the name of Jesus, even though it put their life in limit danger, to watch people like text in and say, yeah, I'll bring soup, I'll bring, I'll bring food, I'll come sit here for a few hours. It was pretty quiet in the church because it was hard to get out on the roads to get here, but if you were really cold and you needed a place, you could have come here. And to see people just wait here in a pretty quiet, empty building for the possibility that someone would come, that is, is when we find out we're not missing the point. And I was perfectly capable of missing it had some church people not reached out and pastored me. And that's what I love about this. You get the perspective God has on things happening around you. Lay your worries, your plans, your needs, desires at his feet. Lay them down to him and let him sort it out. He's the Lord of creation. All you have to do is live into the value we have at the Foundry Church, courageous obedience. It's always worth the risk to obey Jesus Christ. Matthew, um, Matthew 6, 33 and 34, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. And I don't think it means do what God wants and then you get everything you want. I think it means this, seek God first, and what happens is everything God wants becomes everything you want. He'll change, he'll transform the desires of your heart. So for you who are not, well, I also know this, there's many of us out there who feel alone in our calling. Sometimes it's very hard to be um, a stay-at-home mom and you don't see and have a lot of adult conversation. You feel isolated and alone. Maybe you're just running constantly and doing all these different things and you feel like you're surrounded by people but never connecting. For those of you who feel alone in your calling, and I know some of you know what it's like to feel alone in it, not to the extent of Jesus, but you've had a taste. You know what it's like to have friends, coworkers, and family not get you right? Have you ever had that? When people are like, why? Why would you do that? Maybe for you, you've um, walked away from social media because you've found the content on it, the fights that erupt on it, and the different things that go on on social media distract you from what you're called to be. So you've pushed it to the boundaries and you're outside of all the social contacts. You're not in the group chats. If you're in a high school or a middle school, you're not in all the Snapchat conversations. You're outside of all the, the social bubbles. And people don't get you. You're there, but they don't get you. They like you, but you're not in their circles. You know, maybe for you, um, maybe if you're a kid, you're young, and you, you obey your parents even when they're not there. And your friends are like, dude, your parents aren't here. Who cares what you do? You're like, no, I care. It actually matters. That really matters. That it's okay to feel a little bit lonely because you're sharing the air with Jesus at that point. He understood. And it's okay to have these things where people 
don't get you. They don't know why you say no to certain things that they watch, talk about, or do. They like you, they want to be around you, but really, honestly, they don't understand you. And maybe for you, you're obeying God, going into missions, changing the plans you had, or, um, or just, you know, obeying God in a way that seems like to them is a huge mistake. But you know it's the right and obedient thing to do. You're not planning for your, the future that they think is wise. And you're like, oh, Okay, but I'm going to obey you, Lord, and people think it's foolish or unwise, and you look at it and you know you're being faithful. They may love you, but they don't get what you're doing because you're being courageously obedient. Live into that. Jesus was courageously obedient. You're in good company if you feel alone in this world. It's when you feel like you would identify with everyone that I would be anxious and a little bit nervous. And here's my promise. Because, well, it's not my promise. That's a terrible way to say it. Here's God's promise. He will be enough. God will be enough. I want you to look at the tenderness he showed Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is standing with Moses and Elijah. He's standing with Moses and Elijah who do one thing that Jesus can't at that point. They see from heaven's vantage point. God sent two men to talk to Jesus who saw bigger than the disciples could. Have you ever thought of it? He gave Jesus a small group for one night to talk with him about his departure. And his departure would be a flogging, a crucifixion, rejection, and betrayal. And they came and they talked to him and they encouraged him. God knew. God knew that Jesus was afraid. He was human. He knew that it would be upsetting and frightening, but here's the reality. Jesus left that meeting, and it says this in Luke 9. Jesus left the Mount of Transfiguration with what? His face set towards Jerusalem. He now knew for certain what he had to do. He'd been encouraged by a conversation with people who had heaven's vantage point. God strengthened him in the time he needed for his journey, and he will do the same for you. He will help you set your face towards obedience in your calling. Doesn't mean it's easy. But it does mean this, obedience is always worth the risk, even if you feel alone, isolated, and pushed to the margins. Sometimes when that happens, we find ourselves right in the center, really snuggled up close to the heart of God. Pray with me. God, thank you for this morning. Thank you for this church, for this afternoon, this evening, whenever we're gathering, God. We know this, that we as your church are gathered close to you. So may you guard us. May you keep us, and may you protect us. Lord, our hearts are fickle and quick to run away to the noise of the crowd. So may we not be um, steered by the culture, but may we be people who body embody what Jesus did. Get away to a solitary place with you and live in to the calling you've put on our lives that the world would see and know and experience the goodness of God in Christ Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. We pray it all in his name. Amen. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.